Silvanacus Augustus, an unrecorded emperor of Rome. Despite him seemingly having been Roman emperor sometime during the 3rd century, it is unlikely that you have ever heard of Silvanacus. This is because there is no record of him in the written sources. No inscriptions, no statues. Indeed, there was no public inkling that such a man existed until 1937, when the British Museum acquired this silver coin from a Swiss dealer, which had reputedly been found in Lorraine. Its obverse has a radiate portrait of Imperator Mar Silvanacus Augustus, while its reverse presents the god Mercury holding victory and his staff, surrounded by the legend Victoria Augusta. At the time, this was the only coin known to depict Silvanacus. You might think that such uniqueness is a huge plus, but in the case of coins, it can be a major negative. The Romans minted coins in such large numbers that for there to be only one single issue known to exist raises questions over its authenticity. And as it's the only record of Silvanacus, it raises questions over his very existence. Even though the British Museum did not doubt the genuineness of this coin, doubts over the existence of Silvanacus remained throughout the much of the 20th century. This was until a second coin was published in 1996, which had reputedly been found some years earlier near Paris, before entering a private collection. This second coin had the same obverse legend as the first, and to Mars the Defender on the reverse. Better still, the obverses, the side bearing the head or principal design of the two coins, were struck from the same die, which decreases the likelihood of them being fakes. But really, the discovery of a second coin is only the beginning of the journey of trying to unravel the identity and history of Imperator Mar Silvanacus Augustus, a journey that may never have a satisfactory conclusion. Even before looking at the potential timing and circumstances of his reign, we should look at the name Silvanacus itself. Not only is there no emperor or usurper recorded with that name, the name itself is unusual, raising the possibility that Silvanacus was a misspelling. Such mistakes on coins are recorded. Licinius I, ruling from 308 to 324, appeared on coins with his name missing its third I, or gaining an extra N, while Vitranio, the Balkan usurper in 350, appeared as Vertanio on some of his coins, a possible reflection of how hastily his usurpation had been organised, something which could be applicable to Silvanacus. If this usurper's name was not Silvanacus, perhaps the most obvious corruption or misspelling would be with regards to the B in Silvanacus, which can often be a V in disguise. Silvanacus would have a far more recognisable look to it. It could be his name reflects a connection with Silvanus, a Roman god of fields and forests, who may be cognate with, and perhaps even derived from, the Etruscan god of woodlands, Silvans. It would be a stretch to assign northern Italian roots to Silvanacus on the strength of an etymological connection through Silvanus to the Etruscans, but this may be bolstered by the presence of what appears to be a Celtic suffix, Acus. Northern Italy would be a region where Roman, Etruscan, Celto-Gallic would overlap. It is not just the cognomen Silvanacus which is unclear. The meaning of the abbreviation Mar on the coins of Silvanacus also raises questions. The assumption is that it represents Silvanacus' nomen, the name of his family. That would now root down to Marinus, Marius or Marcius. The only other potential name represented by Mar would be Marcus, although that is a prinomen rather than a nomen and it is less likely that Silvanacus would have listed that on his coinage. So it seems that the name Mar Silvanacus does little to provide us with anything beyond flimsy inferences about its potential origins, and unfortunately neither Silvanacus coin has a mint mark to identify where it was issued from. That leaves us with having to rely on the physical makeup and stylistic content of the coins in comparison to others to present some chronological and geographic delineators. The Silvanacus coins are Antonaniniani, a favoured silver denomination worth two denarii of the mid-third century, which just so happens to be a period of significant military turmoil in the Roman Empire. It is referred to frequently as the third century crisis. This period also comes with a considerable dearth of surviving historical material. Chaos and poor sources are the perfect combination for a short-lived emperor or usurper to fall through the historical net. The purity of silver within the coins can be used to suggest a general period especially as the gradual debasing of the silver coinage during the 3rd century is well mapped. There is enough silver in the Silvanacus issues to still make them somewhat valuable, having not yet reduced impurity to the silver wash coins of the 270s. However, debasement is still clear, suggesting the middle decades of the 3rd century. That he was able to mint coins which looked like official issues 
at all might suggest that Silvanacus was active in a region where there was an official mint, but this is not necessarily the case. Barbarian forgeries of imperial coins demonstrate that official looking issues could be produced of sufficient quality to pass as official without the control of a mint. While we may not immediately recognise the emperor or pretender depicted on the coin, there are certain features which may hint at a general time period. In the case of the Silvanagus issues, the radiate crown he wears and the facial features he sports are reminiscent of the coins of the mid-3rd century, although this still encapsulates a significant period of time covering the reigns of six men, Philip the Arab, Trajan Decius, Trebonianus Gaulus, Aemilian, Valerian and his son Gaulianus. Unsurprisingly, with so little to go on, there are numerous proposed backstories for the reign of Silvanagus. The prevailing, although never fully accepted, wisdom regarding Silvanagus has changed significantly in the 80 years since the first coin appeared in the British Museum. The reported discovery of that first coin in Lorraine gave rise to the idea that Silvanagus was operating in that area, perhaps a military commander in Germania Superior along the Rhine. Eutropius records a bellum civil in Gaul being suppressed during the reign of Decius, 249-251, which could be tied to Silvanacus, and perhaps encompassed the end of the rule of Philip the Arab, 244-249 as well. Reports of the second coin being found near Paris could bolster at least the geographic location proposed by this theory. This explanation has been questioned through a potential error in the text of Eutropius. For the location of the Bellum Civil, considered Gallia, some have read Galatia, which would fit in with Aurelius Victor's account of the subjugation of the revolt of Utapian in that area of what is now central Turkey in that period. However, depending on a potential spelling error, is about as speculative as placing Silvanacus at the head of troops in Germania due to the presence of one of his coins near the Rhine and some vague Gallic connection to his name. The appearance of Mercury, a rarely used god before the late 3rd century, on the first coin of Silvanacus could also provide a link to Gaul as Mercury seems to have been a popular figure in that region, with the Gallic Emperor Posthumus, 260-269, also portraying Mercury on his coins. However, this might only mean that Silvanicus had some Gallic connections, not that this was his place of origin or operation. The focus on Mars and Mercury on Silvanicus's coins could be another signifier of their origin in the mid-3rd century, as emperors such as Decius and Valerian, 253-260, had attempted to bolster the unity of the empire through the promotion of pagan religious practice. The discovery of the second Silvanacus coin brought another avenue of speculation. While it was seemingly found near Paris, aspects of the coin seemed to link it, and therefore Silvanacus, to the short-lived reign of Aemilian in 253. The shortened reverse legend of Mars the Defender is of a similar sort used by Aemilian, while the style of bust and radiate appears similar to Aemilian's issues from the mint at Rome. As the two Silvanacus coins share the same obverse die, the likelihood would be that they were produced in the same mint. Therefore, despite the coins being found in Germania and Gaul, it seems that Silvanicus's brief reign or usurpation included control of the mint of the imperial capital. As he is not recorded in the sources, and there are not more coins, it might be suggested that he was recognised in Rome, but nowhere else, and not for any kind of significant period of time. This could suggest that Silvanicus was a garrison commander, who succeeded in having himself proclaimed emperor at Rome in 253, after Aemilian left the city to face the approaching Rhine army of Valerian. This could either have been in opposition to Aemilian, or in the aftermath of Aemilian's assassination by his own men in around September 253, but before Valerian arrived at Rome, perhaps in an attempt to shore up resistance within the city. The presence of his issues so far from Rome is no obstacle to such a positioning of Silvanagus's reign in the city. Indeed, there is something of a traceable line of contemporary movement for such coins to follow from the imperial capital to the Rhine frontier. Upon being called to Italy to aid Tribunianus Gaulus against the usurping Aemilian, Valerian had been serving as an army commander along the Rhine. Those Rhine-based soldiers who followed Valerian into Italy were too late to save Gaulus, but were supremely placed to deal with Aemilian in support of their own commander as Augustus. Seeing to the defeat of Aemilian and then marching on Rome, these men may also have found and dealt with Silvanacus. Part of their spoils were likely to have been any silver coins minted by the fledgling regime in Rome. And while Valerian would eventually head east to fight the Persians, some of the Rhine men who had joined him on his march to Italy are likely to have returned to their Rhine homes. Or perhaps these coins came to Gaul or Nangemania through soldiers formerly loyal to Aemilian or Silvanacus being transferred there after they were pacified. Valerian being a senator may have undermined any resistance Silvanacus could bring together in Rome which, along with Silvanicus's lack of soldiers and legitimacy, 
possibly explains why there is not a recorded battle for the city between these Augusti. Strangely though, even if his reign lasted a very short time, any senatorial support for Silvanakis may see him treated as an official Augustus rather than a failed usurper. Regardless of which story, German or Roman revolt, is closer to the truth, Silvanakis likely met a grisly end. It is not unheard of for Roman emperors to surrender and be allowed to live. However, this was not the trend of the mid-third century. Men who had played the Game of Thrones either had to win or die. There was no middle ground. Therefore, Silvanakis was almost certainly murdered by the forces of Philip the Arab, Decius, Valerian or his own. His reign had been short, to be measured in weeks, perhaps even days rather than months. He may not have made much of an impact on the Roman world, but his existence presents us with an interesting insight into our sources, both literary and physical, and into the 3rd century, which was so chaotic that it managed to see an emperor, possibly ruling in the imperial capital itself, forgotten to the written sources.